Due to some technical difficulties, this program is pre-recorded. This is the J.R. Hendrick Texan gentleman podcast that deals with the early in life of my alter ego, J.R. Hendrick. This episode is in a narrated format, commentary by myself and J.R. Relax and enjoy the adventure. Take care. God bless. Okay, so here we go. Hello everyone, it is time for the start of J.R. Hendrick Texan gentlemen. Get ready, so I get this thing to cooperate. Alright, here we go. I'm looking up the J.R. Hendrick the 7th, 7 p.m. The Hendrick family sits down to dinner. Goulash, mashed potatoes, green beans, sweet tea, and pecan pie. And Jim says, well, um, there's a party at uh, White Castle tomorrow night in Great Falls. It's George H.W. Bush's birthday, and I want the whole family to go there as an apology for not supporting him. And Bessie says, why do we have to apologize at all? And Jim says, woman, you are infuriating. Four days, we fight and we'll stop fight every time you open your mouth. Ooh, Jim. Trouble. Alarm bells. Yeah, school time for him. And, and Betsy's Lou said, don't you patronize me, Jim. And Jim says, well, I'm, I'm going to sit here and take it from you. I'm checking into a hotel. And Gerald says, I'm, I'm going to Grandma's apartment. Those like intern hours. Are a blessing to take me away from all of you. So it's obvious that JR's test, okay? His dad left to go check into a hotel, no doubt, with an extra. So it's Elizabeth's apartment. JR and Elizabeth talk. <clears throat> you know, to hear your daddy talking <sighs> sounds awfully pathetic to me. And Cheryl says, well, you know, I don't like how they argue anymore. Uh, three days straight. And them always contradicting one another. Except for maybe Tuesday morning. Breakfast. Daddy coming in for lunch. And raising hell. And Mama... I'm a reason now with him. And Elizabeth says, You better cut out that hero worship for you. And your dad for this. And Gerald's like, Learn woman eyes. She'll want the air of his ways. Good news is, I'm, uh, taking time off this Friday to Indianapolis, and I won't be ready to return back home. So, Jim wakes up, you know, feeling depressed. And he blames himself for. The problems going on in his marriage, but at the same time, 
he shows himself a lady and this is high class horrid. Which her her name obviously her uh street name is Summer but she's Daisy. So it's two two AM Elizabeth wakes up with a, with stomach pain. She reaches for her tonic and goes to the living room where Thomas and Rachel are um, in the bedroom listening to some 80s rock tunes. Last night, J.R. Uh, had a call and talked uh, to Karen Kreider for what must have been a good almost hour informed from a um, that he would not be at the home group Bible study because of the the birthday party. Well, <laughs> we're all going to figure out what happens with the garden man. 4 a.m. It's 4 o'clock in the morning. And Jim knocks on the door at 14 Heritage Gate. And Betsy's like, who is it? Betsy, it's me, Jim. And so, Betsy, she kind of opens the door and lets, lets him in. Uh, not really saying uh, a word except, you know, Handing him a cup of coffee, taking a coat, uh, and asking the butler to, to, to take his hat. She is smiling because Jim decides to return home. All right, 6 a.m. Waking up in his grandmother's apartment, JR decides. To take a shower. He had to be in Fairfax. By 7.30 that morning. In order to receive his. Uh, briefing papers. And testify before Congress. Newt Gingrich having formed. Uh, informed Dexter. That he wanted J.R. to. Testify before the House Ways and Means Committee. Okay, so now, it's 6.30 a.m. The Hendrick family sits down for breakfast, ah, pancakes, hash browns, toast and fruit. And so, Christine says, I found this in the congressional record. And Jim's like, what did you find? He said, as you know, J.R., you know your supervisor, Dexter, um, right? Well, what I found out was that Rich Avis testified before the House Ways and Committee uh, in January, and he wants you to perjure yourself, Christine said. Yeah, yeah, right. I'll test my big one big on his behalf. I'm going to tell my supervisor what it's up to. And then I'm going to bide my time. And. To the end's it. Uh, by the time I'm done with him, Gerald said. And Jim says, boy, I want first dibs. On this, uh, blow hard. See how firm he is when I get through with him. Okay, so it's obviously getting pretty bad. It's 8 a.m. Jared goes into the planning room and gets, uh, 
and gets ready to give his own, gives a copy of his opening statement. Okay, so it's now 9, 8.30 a.m. Back in D.C., Ron Horth and uh, House Building, uh, Hearing Room 333. This congresswoman says... This meeting is classified. Ladies and gentlemen, the committee chief. Okay, so now. meeting is called to order. Ladies and gentlemen, the chair, the chair, Bill Archer. Be seated. Break this down briefly. Medicare spending hangs in the balance before Congress. For full details, on behalf of the American Conservative Union, I have called for the testimony of James Ryan Hendrick Jr. Um, Mr. Hendrick is working towards a bachelor's degree at Texas Tech University in public affairs, uh, political communication, and advocacy. Um, his specialty at this point seems to be Government Affairs Management and Media Writing. Uh, Mr. Hendrick. Please, please stand. to take place 
and the correct course on whether or not we should extend Medicare spending and where to cut. I'm ready for your opening questions. Mr. Hendrick, you are aware of Rich Avis's consulting record. But we also are aware that Mr. Avis is known to underestimate the benefits of increasing Medicare spending and overestimate a crisis regarding Medicare. Have before me some fact sheets from the Blake Carter Show. Um, committee has already received data analysis from Mr. A Avis's uh, analyst Clifford. Congressman Hume has a question. Mr. Hendrick, my question is, is this. Why is the American Conservative Union advocating for the expansion extension of Medicare spending when the Republican Congress, myself included as, as, a, as a libertarian, say we need to cut spending, cut the growth and red tape going on with Medicare? I'm not sure I necessarily agree with Mr. Avis. My father, as a administrator of public liaison, a small business administration, and the administrator for entrepreneurial affairs, he says that he feels that the president is being misinformed about the issue. And even though he is reluctantly going along with Rich Avis's assessment, he sincerely doubts it. But do you doubt it? I'm just I'm just going by what I've been what I have been told, the research I've been doing, and, and the fact sheets submitted by myself during the internship speaks for the record. Mr. Hendrick, sir. This committee has already questioned Rich Avis once. I'm forced to agree with Congressman Hume. This is a terrifying idea. I'm not sure why Avis is advocating for the extension. It seems like maybe he's in the back pocket of, of news media particularly. To be honest with you at this point, I don't know why I even trust him. How long have you been working with the American Conservative Union? Nine days, sir. Nine days. Did, did Mr. Avis at any point from the start say he had concrete data requesting for the expansion? No. 
know. He did not have the data until the end of the week, which in my book is just absolutely pathetic. Isn't it true that he called you into work during which time your grandmother was recovering from surgery? True. That is, that is true. Thank you, Mr. Hendrick. This concludes this uh, testimony. As counsel for the committee, I would like to ask some questions myself. Mr. Hendrick, are you aware that Mr. Avis was fired by the American Conservative Union in 1989 for the same thing? No, I had no idea. Do you think your father was aware? Uh, a point of order here. Congressman Neil Hume, we're not putting his father on trial. This is hardly the appropriate committee assignment. We're asking him. I knew he was fired. If you ask me, I think it was a mistake that they even hired him on again.
other places that you were gathering uh, evidence? Other than the Blake Carter show? No. Other than talking to Andrew House for dinner a couple of nights ago? No. Did, did you know that today the American Conservative Union is collecting data through some crack research staff with Rush Limbaugh show? Uh, objection, Congressman is... Uh, the witness has no idea that this is going on. Objection agreed and noted. Let's try to wrap this up in a more friendly decorum, please. Mr. Hendrick. Have you ever had to testify before Congress before? Yes. Last summer on behalf of the Small Business Administration. Were you ever questioned this in, in, in depth? I was questioned. It is part of the congressional record and the congressional quarterly for September of 1994. My daddy did teach me how to get a hold of those resources. Did your father ever check with those congressmen who questioned you? Objection, uh, Chairman. Speculation and hearsay. Noted. Mr. Hume, back up. As counsel, I'd like to ask some more questions. Mr. Hendrick, is it not true that you you came and you approached in January of this year Chris Cannon, the congressman of Utah? I did. Was you lobbying for anything in particular? I was completing assignment for my introduction to public affairs. It was a assignment that was given to me to fulfill once the new Congress was in session and once we knew that Mr. Cannon would be reelected. And who do you think would have that knowledge that he was going to be reelected? Um, my professor, Andrew Armour. He takes polls of these matters. How do you know these things? He studies political communication and advocacy. He has to know how to get the data. He showed us how to do research, basic research, to get the data. That's all I know. Objection, uh, objection, chair. Um, Counselor is assuming that Mr. Hendrick has advanced knowledge in, in data gathering techniques regarding members of Congress beyond what's been taught to him by his fathers and professors. So noted, Mr. Hume. You are short leash with me. I'll take up with the questioning for the duration. Mr. Hendrick, you took a hold. You swear that you, you felt that, that Rich Avis is telling the truth. Yes. And I swear, I, I thought, in my heart, I thought he was telling the truth at the time. I sense a buck coming. Objection, chair meeting? No, Mr. Hume. 
I'm now beginning to think he lied. My father was right about him all along. There will be silence in this in this hearing room. Oh, this is bull. This young man is having a decency to come testify before us. And this has gone way too far and long enough. This testimony is a, is over. Mr. Hendrick, you may step down. You and the American Conservative Union are um, are excused from this matter. With great thanks, Mr. Rich Avis. Excuse me, I'm going to be under full investigation by Congress. This testimony hearing is over. Rich Avis, okay. 12 p.m. The family is having a birthday party for Christine in the mansion courtyard. Everyone is celebrating. Little Thomas um, reaches over to JR. JR, it's Christine's birthday. Why aren't you celebrating with us? And Jerry's like, hard day at work. And Jim said, boy, get up. I contact Dexter. He's going to give it, give it tomorrow off. I got to work for you. And the Annapolis. is passing a faith-based initiative. Shouldn't have problem. Yes, I need you to fly down there tomorrow morning and give me some information. The governor didn't want to pass it. But I have a little help from his Catholic uh, constituents, not to mention the Lutheran Senate. And Betsy says, now come on, Junior, your slice of cake is waiting. So Jim taps the sign on the back. At least we told the truth. Rich Avis, uh, Double Cross, y'all. Thing is, Dexter don't know it yet. And I ain't telling him. No. I just told him I don't want him involved when the mess goes down. Okay, so it's 2.35 p.m. And so, just before the birthday party in the East Room of White Castle, J.R. gets his uh, picture taken with a white polo shirt, trousers, and... A jacket for the birthday party of former President George H. W. Bush. So they start in the main dining room. Uh, some seven layer chocolate cake. The conversation was light and everything. So at 4 p.m., Jared's in his office and he writes to Ken. Dear Ken. Dear Cam, having the time of my life here, just got back from 
the birthday party of former President George H. W. Bush at White Castle in Great Falls, Virginia. <coughs> Wanted to wear sweats, but Mama says that's not gentlemanly attire. Leaving for Indianapolis in the morning on an errand from Daddy. The internship kitchen is eating up, so Daddy's uh, giving me a break. I guess the best way to measure the country's reaction and what's going on in Washington, D.C. is a visit to different states. Man, I wish you would come, would, would uh, were here. We could hang out a lot. No Brad and Karen are working uh, at the Heritage Foundation until about five. And I just called Brad and said that I will be available for the home group battle study tonight. I know you had issues with that, but I have to be a pure gentleman. That's what my grandma says. Best friends, JR. So at 6 p.m., So they're in the, they're in the um, townhouse of, of Jim Bob Horton. J.R. Brad and Jim Bob are, and Karen are there, and it's, it's, a, it's a crazy dialogue. And so, Jim Bob Horton says, you know, you know, J.R., our memories die hard. Do you remember that in 1995, during, say, I don't know, January through March? 85. <laughs> uh, you were trying to get back with Leslie Howden, and she turned down and said no. And she says, yeah, I remember... Uh, Virginia Gracia asked me if I would take her to the ranch for dinner to meet Grandma and Granddad. I turned her down and said no. And Karen says, okay, you two. Don't really want to know. We are way beyond schoolboys and schoolgirls. And so Jim Bob, he, he's taking a lot, okay? Fixing to give him the bell. Yeah, and you remember when you came home in March of 1990? And you told me you and Olivia weren't getting along anymore? And I told you that she was just a prep school girl that's headed the wrong way without you. Jim and, and and okay. Sorry, Horton. Alarm bell. Yeah. Big punisher. And and JR oh, JR don't keep this. Yeah, and I remember when I started college. <laughs> and Holly Hawthorne broke up with me. I saw her today on Capitol Hill. I told you. I just wanted to be like my daddy. With all the ladies. And you told me. 
No. Said the prep school taught me a lot better. And, and, and Karen's like, stop. We're of age now. And your mother says, she has a point, J.R. And Jim Bob, and that Brad said that. And J.R. says, just reminiscing, Brad. Of course, it was 8 p.m. at the Cork Bible study. Uh, the topic is honesty. Um, and it's funny, Jim Bob uses it to help uh, J.R. Deal with a deal with with Rich Davis. So it's nine fifteen. Brad dropped Jr. at fourteen and Heritage Gate. Jr. walks into the kitchen. Screw the mother. How was your night? And Jr. is like, I'm a lot better than my day. Okay, so June ninth. Okay, so here it is. 1.45 a.m. So J.R. has a flashback. Um, Reese prep swimming practice at 3 p.m. April 15th, 1988. And Coach John Hershing says, Hendrick! He calls him to, um, to the shower in the pool. And, uh, and Joe's like, yes, sir, coach. And he says, your younger teacher, Mrs. Uh, Richardson, he's acting like a, a spoiled sc- school mom. Docking your grade down to a 68. Well, guess what? It happened. Your grandfather has pulled in the school. And guess what? She had to bump it up to 71. She don't want you to go, but... We need you. Unless we as you as you uh, have you, we forfeit. Thomason is disqualified. You are to do the fifty freestyle at St. Paul's Prep School in Stanton, Texas. And Daryl's like I remember a week later later riding on that bus to Stanton. And discovering that Olivia was around with the guys, not being interested in me. Okay, so at 7.25 a.m., Jago arrives at uh, the charter terminal to find out that Karen... Have been cleared to go with him, too. Uh, she was going to Indiana to look at the possible uh, possibility of any House of Representatives passing a measure. Um, language having to deal with school choice. So it's 7.55 a.m. And the jet departs from Washington, D.C., bound for Indianapolis, Indiana. So it's 11 a.m. Indiana House of Representatives, the governor, governor by, um, Reluctantly signs the FHA initiative bill for small business. But also he announced that he was going to veto the school choice bill. 
sending it back to the assembly. The House Speaker then dismissed the body for recess until September 5th, 1995. I'm taking a cab downtown to the Indiana Department of Education, Karen said. Maybe for lunch in two hours. Uh, executive suite in the Marriott, Jar said. Okay, so it's 10 a.m. Mountain. It's Carl's bed. At the ballroom of the Wyndham Hotel, Jim hosts his radio press conference. And this he criticizes the Clinton administration for being more pro Wall Street. So it's 1 p.m. Eastern at Gerald's executive suite in the Wyndham Hotel. He and Karen are having a shrimp fettuccine Alfredo for room service. I like you, Gerald. I love you, but I'm losing patience with you. And Gerald's like, why are you being that way? <laughs> Look at the charter I paid for. I paid for this hotel. I paid the lunch. And you say that you're losing patience for me? And she says, tell me this, Jr. Have you heard from your ex-girlfriend, Jennifer Bowers? And Gerald's like, she's testified before the British Parliament as part of a class project of the London School of Economics. Is that enough for you? And she said, unbelievable. She dumped you, and you're still following her. And, and Gerald's like, I told you. I don't know how many times I told you it's over between me and her. I want a chance with you. Please don't ruin this. I'm sorry, JR. Mom called me before I got on the plane, blasting me getting on the trailer line with you instead of flying commercial. It's not your fault. She's a career woman in the midst of a uh, sixth marriage. 1 p.m. Mountain at the uh, Burroughs Center for Economic Development in Carlsbad. Jim is giving a speech um, on the entrepreneurs about the future of economic development. 3 p.m. Um, Eastern. J.R. sends an email to his father when he gets a phone call from his supervisor, Dexter. Man, you were right! I am so sorry. We got duped about it. Idiot Rich Avis. It's okay. Because Alex Bowden is going to consult with us. Here on out. And if I can help it, Amos will get arrested for fraud. And Kieran's like, what was that all about?
Mother's rich billionaire is trying to cheat me and my boss. And Karen said, Get this sucker arrested as soon as you get a chance, Karen said. Okay, so now it's 1.50 p.m. Mountain. Uh, TM, uh, and Daisy getting to a stretch limousine bound for the University of Calls Bad. And headed towards the La Quinta Hotel in Carlsbad, New Mexico. Tonight they would have dinner with the governor. Bruce King. <laughs> we'll see if that actually happens. 3.55 p.m. At the window in Carlsbad, two and Daisy goes for a swim. It was Daisy who was originally identified as Summer who had a a tryst with Jim at Walworth, Washington, D.C. and the gun the window and calls that. <laughs> bad boy, bad boy. 9.15 p.m. Eastern Dara and Karen arrive at the airport uh, Indianapolis to the security screening on board another uh, color jet that would take them to Reagan International Airport. Okay. June 10th, 2.50 a.m. Mountain. Jim wakes up and makes himself some coffee. Last night's dinner with the governor did not go very well at all. And Jim is just talking about how he can take him all through and flying back to Washington, D.C., and apologize to Betsy. But Cowboy Jim McDonald persuaded Jim that they should stay. They're turned into Jim, Jim speaking at the Business Association and a second chance dinner with the governor As a private audience. Also last night, Jim had a very bad argument with Claude and uh, Janet, and almost called Betsy asking her to tear up the invitations to Claude's wedding. Uh, but Mike Fields told him to think about it. That a friendship was not to be torn away just because Claude spent $100,000 on a new deal. Okay, so it's 5.25 a.m. Jerry wakes up and goes down to the front lounge of the mansion. Last night, Mike Fields told him about an angry phone call between his parents. His plan today was to call Brad and Jim Bob and see if they could Spend some time with him today. And 
and they wanted to because it was a brief meeting at the Heritage Foundation. Okay, so it's 6.30 a.m. The family uh, sits down for breakfast. Um, boiled eggs, cinnamon toast, bacon, and a choice of milk or orange juice. Hey, hey where's Christine? Grandma Liz was asked. And Betsy's like, well, probably still, uh, she, she got a summer party last night with Jennifer and Monica, Betsy says. You better have a talk with that girl before she starts getting wild. And Melissa Marie says, I think I may have been a little too late for that. I saw her coming into Uncle Jim's office yesterday uh, to drink some whiskey. And... I was like, well, tell me something I don't know. She's been drinking off and on since she was 12. So Bessie says, with JR, your father and I do our best to control her drinking. What's everybody planning to do today? And Bobby says, Kevin is taking me to a youth uh, rally at the church this morning. And they're going to be watching the Nationals on TV. I'm going to try to go ahead and get a hold of Brad and Jim Bob. Spend the day with them. Can't you join a nice weekend at home? And, and Jerry was like, I'm sitting here trickling around my phones? I don't think so. And so, Grandma Liz would correct her. Don't pray it now, Betsy. Now, your husband was in Nashville chasing fame and skirt. And you were in Baton Rouge, New Orleans, chasing fashion sales. Your daddy was raising JR to be a gentleman and a seal. A gentleman's challenge. So don't you criticize him. <laughs> okay, so now it's it's five ten a.m. Mountain, and Jim's waking up in his hotel room reading his Bible. So it's ten a.m. Eastern. Gerald Bad and Jim Bob attend a lecture of Dr. Frank Leggett. An economics lecture at the Arlington University College. 1 p.m. Eastern. J.R.G. Mound and Brad are having lunch at the Bush Burger Tavern. A franchise owned by Constantine Bush and currently uh, owned by his son, Harry Bush. Now, Harry, he's enlisted... And he's been in the Air Force Academy in 1984 and graduated. Now he's at the rank of major. So there's a military guy that's uh, owned the restaurant. So it's now 2 p.m. It's in the Heritage Auditorium and J.R. and Jim over there. And they're listening to Donna Sowell, Chief Aide to Senator uh, Bill Graham. Uh, and the outgoing Assemblies of Christ Reverend Isaac uh, Freeland. 
the Reverend was announcing what was going to be his candidacy on a successful one for Congress against Bill Hume. 1 p.m. Mountain. Jim returns to his hotel suite feeling deflated. He had had another falling out with Betsy. So he decides to take Daisy to J. Lazy uh, Pub. <laughs> 2 p.m. Mountain. In the pub, Jim orders him and Daisy um, some ice cream brownie sundaes. He tells her that he took her uh, to Carlsbad on retainer to see how she would do um, as a consultant back in Texas. Okay, so it's 5 p.m. Eastern. Uh, Jared's having roast beef and potatoes and green beans with his grandmother. And Elizabeth says, Okay, Junior. Why couldn't you be more of a gentleman and keep your mama company? And Jared's like, No. I think it's Grandma. But let me say, Mama and Daddy fighting for almost a solid week. I gotta listen to Thomas fighting with you about Rachel. And on top of this, this bit big in there. Uh, tries to double cross me and my boss. You know? I'm going to ask my boss for a vacation from all this. I'm sorry, Junior. You're right. They say changes, people. Look at how it changes your daddy. Just sort of just sort of they're fighting over cow. And now look at them. They're filing over stupid stuff like money and clothes, Elizabeth said. Thomas is Thomas coming in sometime Monday, and I'm going with him to El Paso. <sighs> wow. Okay, 6 p.m. Kiara's moping in his room, feeling lonely. Uh, because Kevin and Bobby are watching the Nationals. He's not of much sport since his uh, granddad died. And Betsy comes in and checks on her son. Let me guess. Your excursion with Brad and Jim Bob didn't go uh, ended too soon, Betsy said. <laughs> Jim Bob was scared of raining. Uh, when, when it's in the dark, Jerry said. There's something strange about that that group of eight friends. It's really too bad that Ken didn't, uh, couldn't be here. <coughs> Not much I can do about that. i tell you what. Christine is spending another night with Jennifer and Monica. So I think maybe... I'm going to bake you some, some brownies. Uh, really quick, come down to the kitchen and we'll talk. Okay, so it's 5 p.m. Mountain. Jim and Daisy, you will be back at the hotel suite. You know, with the governor kind of being delayed. Um, Jim is feeling restless. He only is rapidly angry at the Clinton administration sitting on this wild goose chase. He thinks about returning back to Washington, D.C. tomorrow. But conservative Democratic congressman 
uh, Carmen Street was to be at a community rally for the uh, community of Christ. 6.30 p.m. Claude meets Jim and Daisy at the, at the, the Lazy J bar thing. They were waiting to go on the governor to come back from San Jose. Finally, the governor shows up apologizing for being late. He was... Getting tired of a phone call from Montana, Montana Governor Mark uh, Restacott urging him to uh, pass face based initiatives for small business. At uh, 10 p.m., JR is in his office typing on his note taker, his talking note taker that was given to him by the state when Kevin walks in. Ugh. The Nationals. Plus the game nearly, uh, lost their game nearly. And uh, Kevin McDonald says, maybe I should have watched it. But since Granddad died, I lost the interest in baseball. Well, there's the Red Scout uh, rally tomorrow night in the Arlington Park, uh, Lutheran Church. You're coming with me. <laughs> awesome, huh? Yeah. The blessing, you know. <laughs> okay. June 11th. When I am. Jim has a flashback dream. It's July 4th, 1984. Thanks to you, get out of the school for the blind now. Thanks to you, and yeah. now what are you doing back from Nashville? And Jim says, Grandma Elizabeth, I'm here to see my family. I realize that Betsy and I, uh, I weren't here for Easter. And that was because I had a uh, relative that passed away in Montana. He broke KR's heart. He had to go stay with your brother, Carl. Because you thought that we were not good enough to help him. Jeremy Swain walks in. Yes, dear, should in Nashville. Because you broke my grandson's heart. And let me tell you something. Kyle Andy. I would take him to, to, to this plane to go to summer school. And I happen to know you're chasing that uh, the singer up there in Asheville. I'd be damned to show a shame to show my face around here again. You need to come back to my daughter. Or we toss out in the damn wind. Okay, so it's 3.15 a.m. Mountain. Jim wakes up in his hotel room. Uh, he makes himself a cup of what? Uh, cups of coffee. Last night dinner with the governor. 
was awesome. Now, meanwhile, Jr. is journaling with his talking notator living in by the state. He thinks about his father actually missing him. Okay, so it's 5.15 a.m. Mountain. In his hotel suite, Jim, uh, relaxing, thinking about the night before. Planning that he's only going to be in Carl's bed. Uh, for Claude was only going to be in Carl's bed for business. And he, he had taken Janet with him. Jim is glad to be leaving on Monday morning. And he learns that Claude will be home in Midland on Tuesday afternoon. This morning he was going to first assume that Christ in Carl's bed. And that evening he was going to be uh, political dinner with a uh, rally, the same church with Congressman, uh, the same, the Congressman. He also learned that Bob Wilt Lipscomb, coming from Fort Worth for a TV interview with him, with Blake and Katie Carter's marriage in disarray, Jim is glad to be having a true conservative legend be interviewing him. Okay, so it's 7.30 a.m. Eastern. The family sits down for breakfast. And Bessie's like, all right, Christine has asked to stay with Jennifer and Monica. And I told her she had to be back by Friday morning. Uh, and I promised Grandma Elizabeth, I, I asked Grandma Elizabeth not to return to El Paso um, with Uncle Tom, which um, Tom, uh, Tom may be returning with Amy Kathleen tomorrow. I tried to invite Kyle uh, to come see us on Father's Day, and he said no. So, I told your daddy last night we're joining up for Fairfield, Virginia that Sunday to see you, Jr. And Bessie says, because I know this hasn't been an easy uh, summer. No one easy internship. But let's try to get along as a family. And Betsy, and Betsy, and Betsy, I love nothing more. Elizabeth Marie said. But I'll be squalling between you and Uncle Jim. This plus squalling between Elizabeth and Thomas. Over Rachel. You have to understand where JR and I are coming from. And JR says, I can hack it. I'm having church and then lunch with Karen Crowder. And then Kevin is going to meet the Red Scout rally tonight. Okay, so it's 7 a.m. out in gym and. Daisy are having pancakes as for room service and hotel suite. Uh, Jim is confident that the final day of Carl's bed should go pretty well. <laughs> well, we all couldn't, we can all hope. He's like, so when did I get my job? And Jim says, Nicodemus Foods uh, 
It's going to be transferred uh, totally to Dallas by Friday. You'll have to get on the 5.45 a.m. flight uh, to come over there by 8 o'clock. I'm asking Frank Vicente to drive you, to pick you up and take you uh, for your first day on the job. Frank is also arranging a penthouse for you. Ooh. A penthouse. <laughs> Jim? I think he's being naughty. Yeah, I think he's just flandering. Oh, Jim. You're going to be the boss, best boss in the world, he said. And, and Jim, he's like, Ashley, you'll be working with my wife and my son. Hell, Debbie Burton's really pimp. <laughs> so it's 9.30 a.m. Eastern, and J.R. is at Jerusalem Baptist Church with, with Karen. <sighs> and it's the first time in a while. Karen just seems awfully cool and distant. Okay. Uh, J.R. is in a single Sunday school class. The topic is, uh, is evangelism. But the topic is lost on, on J.R. On, on and why? Karen, impatient, alarm bells. <laughs> First Jim, now Karen. No wonder J.R. Okay, 11 a.m. Jim is in the first assemblies of Christ Church for his morning assembly and Sunday school. For the first time since childhood, Jim actually felt at home. 1.30 a.m., and 1.30 p.m. Eastern. <sighs> Karen drops her out rather rudely at his grandfather's apartment. And so Kevin, he found Jr. moping. And he's like, man, Junior, what's wrong with this time? And Jerry's like, Karen, she all, I lost all patience with me today. And Jerry said, grousing, man, Amber Freiberg has been asking all over about you. That's why I want you to come to the Red Scout rally, rally. If Karen can't handle you, then I know Amber wants to see you. Maybe you guys can go out on an actual date. I think Karen is being mental about wanting Brad again. Oh, no. <sighs> We're not doing this again. <sighs> you see, your dad called Dexter in light of what happened with Rich Avis. <sighs> On Friday, you get the rest of the month off and flying, like, flying with you to Philadelphia. And we're having a good long drive. <laughs> and drink uh, to Jeep Grand, Grand Church until we get to Baton Rouge in time for the 4th of July weekend. <laughs> so it's 1.40 a.m. Mountain. Jim and Daisy, they're in the charter jet. It's how they're going to stay the night there. 
I noticed some phone conversation between him and Betsy. He has got them pre-preserved. Uh, 3.50 p.m. Tara is praying and crying in the home chapel. And Elizabeth Reed walks in. And she's like, please tell me what's wrong. I think I have some appreciation and understanding about what you went through with Frank. I'm sorry. My girl Karen has no patience. You're smarter than her. And you're smarter than Frank, Elizabeth Marie said. I mean, think about it. Her mother is known all over this state as being this feminist tramp. They were not to Joe, to Joe not to ever date her, ever. You know, maybe you should leave, Karen. Okay, so at 7 p.m., Arlington Park, Lutheran Ch Church, it's a Red Scout rally. Who should sit next to JR? But Amber. So, Amber. Okay, this is the, the last leg here. 2.15 a.m. Uh, Mountain. The charter jet carrying the Hendrick Party departs from uh, Carlsbad International Airport uh, down for Dulles International Airport. 4.45 a.m. Daryl's up and praying in the Mansion Home Chapel. In the Mansion Front Lounge. <coughs> But he was going to show to do some early duty for the internship. Okay, 6 a.m., JR shows up at work and is told to report by in another auditorium. Okay, guys, are you ready? Because from now on, Bowden is going to be the guy who's consulting. Thanks to Abel's double crossing us, Dexter said. Now listen up, Bowden said. Through Clifford, his stupid analyst, Avis has bribed Senator Cordell Wheeler. That's who we're depending on uh, to get some assistance. Gerald's father is, is not involved in, in this week. He's returning from Carlsbad this morning and is headed for Cleveland on Thursday, Mrs. Rackman said. Well, so much the better, Weldon said. You're going to have to compel, compile the information on your own, uh, Rackman said. How the hell do we do that, Dexter said. Well, you might have a little help. There's a... Uh, uh, SBA Public Affairs liaison named Bill Mayer. Maybe I can talk to you. Oh, I don't like his personality. I'd like to talk to someone like Francis Blackwell. Care is going to have that chance. They're on this week. But he doesn't matter. 
Your checks get cashed by the work you do. So with that, to JR and interns, go there and they go to Washington, D.C. to talk to Bill Mayer. All right, 9 a.m., Arlington University College, uh, Marriott School of Trade and Commerce. JR is taking the LSAT. <laughs> 12 p.m., uh, Betsy and Jim are having lunch together in the private band. Pretty much all they're saying is like a small dog. Except, well, Jim's glad that JR is taking the L set. 1 p.m. Using his note taker provided by the state, JR is writing the writing sample of the exam, the final part of it. 2.30 p.m. JR arrives home and goes upstairs to the Dream Team Lounge. He sees Amy Kathleen there. She embraces him. And he goes into the meeting uh, room with his father, the Dream Team meeting room. Now, side note here. Uncle Tom doesn't co uh, come. He's calling some consulting duty. Now, the Dream Team, this is what's going on. Clinton administration is trying to escape Whitewater and silence conservatives, Jim said. They can't do that. Hugo Black. Congress shall make no law. Rosenberg, Ken Rosenberg, uh, Dave Rosenberg said. Even if it is the president, he cannot use allies in the government to make laws or policies harming freedom of speech. It's easy to see what's going on, Michael Pierce said. For the past six months, they've been trying to hide the dark side of white water. And every scandal that Clinton did in Arkansas. The thing is, we need to fight fire with fire. Jim. I recommend exclusive interviews only. I'm trying to do more on regular until we can find out what's going on. Who? Oh, certainly not Blake Carter. I think we all know by now that Blake Carter is unstable. Who? Oh. Certainly not Blake Carter. I think we all know by now that Blake Carter is unstable. <laughs> He's having problems in in this marriage, Jim said. Betsy told me that Katie don't love him no more. At 3 p.m. in his office, Jim is interviewed by Walt Lipscomb. 4 p.m. Uh, JR completes a fact sheet from information received by Bill Mayer. Dexter had called JR, um, saying the same senator who had been voted against his father, Professor Drilling, was now supporting, uh, the extension of Medicare spending with limits. Okay, so it's 10, 6, 10 p.m. The family sits down for, to a Mexican dinner. And their guests are Walt and Faye Lipscomb. Okay, 9 p.m. Girls are upstairs in the kitchen having ladies night out. Baking, cooking. The men are downstairs. Well, minus Thomas and Jared. Well, maybe Thomas for a while. They're all inebriated. They're watching Batman forever. Or JR sitting there with Thomas and Rachel. And, and they're listening to music. And they're Def Leppard. And... 
Jeff Waxon. Um, he called Charlie Nation. T.R. Charlie Nation? Punishment. Alarm bell. He learned that Charlie had the hots for Molly Hawthorne. So he sneaks into his grandma's apartment and gets a sword of romance model. Well, suddenly, a red-haired woman walks away to the, uh, walks up to the drive and makes his way up to, to, um, and she's, she's like, hi, Junior. You know how cute I always thought you were. <laughs> Danger, JR. Danger, danger, danger. <laughs> Holly. Of course, JR sees what's going on. He's like, look, Holly, what did we get? Where you, where you came from? Why don't you take it back? So, so suddenly Betsy acts out. She's like, what's, what's going on, JR? What's wrong? And she sees Holly. He's like, um, What the hell are you doing here? And she's like, well, his father knows that Jr. is kind of lonely. That Miss Karen Crowder is getting kind of cold. I want to hear him in the nut. And Bessie's like, I'm warning you to stay away. And we want to just, just go on and get, you know, You know what I'm saying? Just get out of here. You're not welcome here at the, uh, 14 Heritage Gate. Woo! Holy moly crap. I mean, woo! Now, hope you enjoy listening to the J.R. Hendrick Takes and Gentlemen. If you like what you hear, please subscribe, become a part of the adventure. This is the James Hendrick Empowerment Network saying until next time, get ready for the rest of the story. It's going to get more interesting for them here.